Thank you so much for tuning into the Psychology Is podcast. I'm back for part two with Dr. Chris Ferguson. Thank you for joining me again, Chris. Well, it's awesome to be back. I'm looking forward yes. to it. Yes, me too. So the reason that we decided to have a two-part conversation was because you've written books on multiple topics. You have multiple areas of expertise. And uh, in the first conversation we had, people who listened know that it was about how madness shapes history, how people with, you know, disorders and who are downright insane sometimes take on positions of leadership. They're exalted into positions of leadership and, and uh, affect the course of history significantly. So that was a great conversation and I recommend people listen to it if that's a topic that's interesting. Today, we are focusing on a, on a whole different topic, which is based on your book, Moral Combat, um, how the violent war, or I'm sorry, how, why the war on violent video games is wrong. And I have many, you know, people I know who would be interested in this and students I know who would be interested in this. And I'll have you know that my son of all the experts I've brought on, this was the topic <laughs> that he was most intrigued by. So yeah, some questions from him as well. Awesome. Um, yes. So first, will you just kind of paint the picture? What does this war on violent video games look like? Yes, yeah, it does feel like a violent war sometimes, mm. <laughs> uh, even among the scholars. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, I mean, I think the best way of thinking of it is most of us can remember when we were kids that there were some kind of culture war going on about whatever technology or media the kids were doing at that particular moment. So um, when I was growing up, I remember it was a combination of rock music and, and Dungeons and Dragons were kind of at the forefront um, at, at that time. Everybody thought that you know rock music was gonna cause suicide and violence and Satanism and same thing for Dungeons and Dragons. And, you know, then you can go back in the 1950s and people were doing the same thing over comic books. And you can, you can, you know, 1940s, it was radio. You just kind of go back through past all the way to Plato's dialogues where you can see these ancient Athenians complaining about Greek plays and stuff. So there's, there seems to be this kind of repetitive pattern where particularly older elements of society, old people um, get suspicious of, of whatever form of, pop culture or media or technology that's particularly common among young people and tend to assume it has this pernicious negative impact on young people's well-being. So video games is really, you know, just one more turn of that cycle, uh, if you will. I mean, the, the interesting thing, um, I mean, you, you can see examples where psychiatrists and psychologists got involved in, I mean, there were, were research papers on radio addiction back in the 1940s, for instance. So mm -hmm. it certainly isn't the only time that like, you know, the, the sort of social science community got involved, but really beginning with television and, and then television into video games, there was this big investment uh, by groups like the American Psychological Association, by psychologists in general, to sort of get involved in this sort of cultural debate um, in, in ways that I don't think really benefited us <laughs> in, in, in the end, uh, necessarily in, in terms of like helping psychology's credibility. Uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's sort of part of the, the, the sort of the interesting question is, is how do social science fields like psychology, not limited to psychology, but like psychology get invested in these things? And, and do we, you know, do an effective job at communicating to the public data on these issues when the data sometimes is, is flawed or nuanced or complicated. Right. And uh, so, I, so I think there are a lot of lessons in here about how we maybe could do some of this stuff better uh, as a field. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and my sense is that there were many psychologists who were investigating this topic in the past and even currently who are part of that older generation on a personal bias level is quite suspicious and critical of violent video games and maybe they don't have experience with them themselves maybe they have kids who do and so they only kind of see it from a distant point of view and i would imagine that it's very difficult to remove your own bias from that when analyzing yeah. the data 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all human, you know, is, is the reality of it. Um, yeah, and I think it was, you know, some of it is generational, I think, and you can actually see this in surveys. So, you know, uh, our lab and other labs have actually done surveys of scholars and the general public and clinicians and other groups. And you basically see the same thing that, you know, sort of boils down to, I'm, I'm certainly flattening some nuances here, but, you know, uh, old people don't like video games. And that's true if they're scholars who study video games, it's true if they're clinicians and it's true if they're the general public. So it's interesting, you kind of see this variable um, is consistent, you know, so even among people who theoretically have access to the data, that doesn't matter. It still mm. makes mostly age and dislike of kids. People who don't like kids don't like video games. Mm. It's thing you can go pretty consistently too. Um, you know, so, so that's kind of, you know, an interesting thing too, but you kind of think like with psychology in particular, I think, also, part of it was, you know, sort of a straight line between like Bandura and the Bobo Dow studies through to this whole thing of television and, and video game mm. violence. Now, now, I'll say frankly, I'm not really a big fan of, of Bandura's Bobo Dow studies. I don't think they're studies of aggression at all. But mm. um, tell me but, why, you know, if, you don't mind, if you don't mind going there for a second. Yeah. What's your, what's your critique or your criticism? They're basically compliance studies. They're basically like, you know, what they did is they take these kids in uh, to sort of this official you know, setting and then gave them no instructions other than to show them these videos and then put them in the room, you know, where the toys were, where, you know, that were shown in the video. And with no other instructions, I think the kids just were following directions, you know, mm. for the most part. I don't think mm. they felt aggressive, uh, mm. if you will. I think it was, you know, a great study about demand characteristics that if you give people no other instruction other than something you show them in a video, and, you know, and certainly if the people in the video are rewarded versus punished for what they did, that's going to have some influence. That's, mm. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily, you know, contradict so the fundamentals of of learning by watching, you know, or mm. vicarious reinforcement. But the idea that this told us anything about aggression specifically, mm. the idea that simply watching someone be aggressive made you more motivated to be aggressive, other than do whatever was in the video to get the, the candy bar, whatever the hell they mm-hmm. gave them. I don't remember what the reward was. Uh, you know, um, yeah. So I, I think that's what happened is people kind of took it and. It's not that it's wrong to say social learning happens, but this idea that this tells us about how people learn aggression specifically was probably uh, an incorrect generalization from that uh, set of studies. But people went with it. And now decades later, we have these, <laughs> these long fields of like television violence and then video game violence that are all garbage. <laughs> you know, that's mostly it's like uh, half a century of, of nonsense uh, is what we've ended mm-hmm. up with the consequence of that. People, people should have probably thought about the, the Boba Dell studies a bit more critically mm-hmm. and applied them a little bit more in a, in a limited way. Um, but I think on the other hand, you know, psychology didn't really have much else on its plate, you know, in terms of what to offer, you know, the skin, de- skin area and opera conditioning was on its way out. And, and, uh, you know, unlike psychiatry, which has, you know, genetics and biological, you know, sort of stuff, we didn't really have a whole lot else. It was just social learning. So I think, you know, there was a certain bias there as well, that this was the thing that we could offer, you know, and it's not, again, it's not, again, it's not that it's wrong. It's that, uh, you know, if the only tool you have is a, as a hammer, as they say, everything begins to look like a nail. Mm-hmm. And so people began to, I think, you know, over apply it in, in mm-hmm. ways that maybe were not, you um, not good, not, not helpful or not accurate. Yeah. So sort of, again, uh, flatten seems to be the word I have in my mind today, but sort of flattening over a lot of nuances and complexities in, in terms of how people engage in social learning yeah. and just, Oh yeah. If you see it, you're going to do it more. Right. You know? And it right. uh, doesn't seem to be, yeah. And that doesn't seem to be how it's worked out. I mean, we now know with the replication crisis and all that, that a lot of this stuff is untrue that people don't really learn that. I mean, I guess it's good news. Yeah. I gotta say people don't really learn very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually kind of a negative thing in many respects, but in some respects it's positive, you know, so it's, it's not as simple as people watch something and they do it, you know, or are more inclined to do it or do it with higher frequency. Oftentimes we don't. I mean, you know, um, as a parent, and, and you mentioned being a parent yourself, it'd be a lot easier if that were true, <laughs> that, you know, if, uh, kids would just model what we would tell them to do mm. or show them how to do, you know, uh, I wouldn't have had to mow my lawn for years if that was the case. <laughs> um, but, uh, but things are a lot more complicated than that. But, but I think there was this kind of bias, not just in terms of age, but in the sense of like, hey, look, this is what psychology has to offer. And if we say that this is bunk, we don't really have a whole lot else you know, necessarily, you I know, see. again, I, I may be, you know, a bit more nihilistic in saying that, that I really mean to be, but, but I think that probably did set up some of this reluctance, particularly for groups like the APA and, and others to, to, you know, um, be really, really reluctant to let go of 
video game violence and by extension television violence research, um, which they had emphasized as a cornerstone in many respects of mm. what psychology had to offer for uh, for decades. Mm. Interesting. Okay, so that's some, that's that's good historical context around this, and and so now we still you know have I think um, a vision in some people's mind of a loner kid, young man, usually, who's just playing video games for hours every day, and they're violent, where he's killing people or, or other things. And then he gets these ideas to be violent, and he's desensitized to the to this feeling of violence. And then he has no inhibition when he wants to go enact that in the real world. So why is that you know, can, can you kind of debunk that image and, and just talk about what, what the data really show? Sure. Well, I mean, I mean of course, the image itself is a stereotype, you know, is uh, the, you know, the reality of it and that, you know, gamers, you know, so you, you can certainly find some gamers that fit that stereotype. Um, but of course, you know, gamers are a diverse audience at this point. I mean, you know, I think, you know, uh, probably if you look at adults age 55 and below, most of us grew up. Uh, with the Atari 2600 or, or cabinet games and arcades and such. Uh, so that seems to be the dividing line now. Mm. I'm, I'm about to hit 50, so it's probably a little bit older than me, about 55, I'd say. I'm pretty comfortable hammering that down. Um, that, you know, above that tends to be that, like, old people, you know, sort of, like, clutching their pearls over video games. And then under that are people that are just kind of comfortable with them because they grew up with mm. them. Um, but, you know... Um, Women play games, you know, yeah. uh, girls play games, you know, people who are popular play games, <laughs> you know, most games are social. Uh, most people play games socially, including kids. So it's not necessarily the loner in the basement, you know, um, you know, sort of thing. Um, and, you know, for the most part, there, there, there are some people that overdo it with games, but of course there are people that overdo lots of other things as well. But, um, you know, there's just not evidence to suggest that gaming in general is is associated even correlationally with things like social isolation or mental health or, you know, aggression or violence uh, or, 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 or things like that. So there really is this kind of combination that first off, the stereotype is a stereotype. We have to really start thinking like, you know, probably one of the things that makes it hard to correlate video gaming with any kind of outcome, positive or negative these days with with the uh, minors, with kids is they all play video games. So if you have no variation, it's hard to use that thing to, 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 to predict anything else. Uh, it's just, it's just widespread. It's almost like a, a red flag. If a kid doesn't play video games in some respects, um, and we can kind of talk about that in a little bit as well, but, um, you know, so there is that sort of stereotype issue, but also it's just the evidence. The evidence doesn't suggest that you can use gaming habits as a predictor of negative outcomes um, or positive outcomes, you know, to, to be, to be fair, uh, to, to some extent, it's just a routine for the common activity that doesn't really do much in terms of predicting people's outcomes, um, mm. at the point. So mm. what, tell me about what, what is the grand theft fallacy? <laughs> so I think that was really Patrick's, uh, uh say, so he, you know, he's, he's my co-author on the book, mm -hmm. uh, that really kind of comes out of some of his thinking, uh, but it's, it's kind of this idea that, and he would be able to explain it better than I would, but it's kind of this idea that, um, there's this kind of like clear linkage between playing video games or certain games. And the reason, you know, Patrick uses Grand Theft Auto is the, as the example exemplar is because that's probably the one you hear of the most, uh, maybe a call of duty as well, but mm -hmm. you know, people will kind of assume that, you know, grand theft auto or games like it are associated with, you know, high profile violent crimes. So there's this assumption that um, there was just, actually there was just a case in Florida a few weeks ago of a boy and a girl, I think they were 14 and 12 who ended up getting into a firefight with uh, sheriff's deputies. They broke into a house and there were some guns in the house and they, and they ended up in, you know, this firefight, you know, I think fortunately nobody was killed. I think the girl was wounded, uh, but I think she survived uh, in the end. And these were two kids that had a long history of, of, of various mental health and, and correctional, you know, criminal justice issues. Um, but, but I think so, at some point the, when she was apprehended, and like I said, she was wounded, I believe, uh, she, she made some off the, off the cuff comment to the 
police officers about something like, you know, we were just planning the, you know, I forget, I, I'm going to bastardize the quote. So this is an exact quote, something like, you know, we were planning the, the to light this up like Grand Theft Auto or something like that. And then of course, you know, everybody's like, oh, the magic words were spoken. <laughs> you know, the magic words, you know, as video games made them do it. Now keep in mind, she never said she played Grand Theft Auto. She just simply referenced Grand Theft. I don't know, she might have, or she might not have. I don't know that anybody's ever found out that she actually played the game or not. But she may, you know, of course, everybody's heard of Grand Theft Auto, you know, so it's not clear that she was saying she played it as opposed to simply referencing a thing everybody knows about, um, you know, so, but there was this kind of like for a day, you know, <laughs> like, you know, everybody started, oh, it was Grand Theft Auto and made them do it and, and, and this sort of thing. So that's the grand, that's the grand theft fallacy is that particularly if a youth utters magic words like Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto or something like that, then there's a massive leap to like, you know, ignore years of mental health problems, family instability, the fact that these were kids that were in foster care. None of that matters anymore. <laughs> they mentioned the magic words and all we're going to talk about is video games, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from this point forward. So there is this kind of tendency, you know, to particularly if it's a young person that commits a high profile violent crime and this at least got local news in Florida. I don't know if it became national, um, but, uh, you know, if it's a young person commits a high profile act of violence and people are kind of looking for like you know to the these kind of magic where somebody mentioned video games if an older person mentioned you know commits a high profile violent act nobody mentions video games whatsoever you know so mm. uh and the case i sometimes refer to is and i don't remember the gentleman i, I shouldn't say gentleman he's a killer uh but the fellow's name uh and that was the i think it was 2018 the uh las vegas shooting mm -hmm. uh where a 64 i believe year old male smashed out a window of his, his, of his hotel room and started firing down on a country music festival. And I, I forget the exact body toll, but it's something like 60, 60 people got killed or something like that. I think he has the record in the United States now. And he was like, he was 64. So, you know, nobody, nobody mentioned video games ever. Um, and, and, you know, in that case, you know, nobody speculated about it. Nobody points out and says, well, you never played video games. So what, you know, why we keep bringing this up? You know, that's kind of the, the, the issue of the, of the grand that fallacy is, is for young perpetrators, people are looking for that explanation um, and tend to glom onto it when, again, sort of like the magic words are spoken. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's pretty clear confirmation bias, right? You know, so people are looking for cases that fit the narrative and ignore the cases that don't fit the narrative. And you still see people will think that certain cases that, um, so it turns out mass homicide perpetrators actually play fewer video games than, than other males of their age. Mm -hmm. um, which is the inverse of what people would, would think. But you, you see these cases where sort of you know, the official investigation reports found that the perpetrator did not play vinyl video games, or at least had not recently played vinyl video games um, within the last few years or so. And, uh, and, and even though that comes out in these official investigation report, people still think these shooters were tied to violence in video games. And the two I always think of are the Virginia Tech shooting, it turned out he mostly played Sonic the Hedgehog, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but there was a, there was a movie. If you've seen the movie, it probably gives you... I actually haven't seen the movie, but I played okay. the game. I know the uh, game well. <laughs> and then, I, then, of course, the 2012 Sandy Hook shooting is the other one, where it turned out he mostly played Dance Dance Revolution, mm. um, yeah, which is, as it sounds like, is a dancing game. You know? right. So, again, I can't say that these two fellows had never played a violent video game, but they certainly played violent video games much less frequently than other males of their age, you know, appear to normatively do. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of what, you know, uh, I, I think, yeah, again, Patrick really likes that term. So it's got a nice, nice flair to it. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we're really referring to when we think of it, the grand theft fallacy is, is the rush to judge and rush to assume that, you know, turns out this 14 year old played violent video games like every other 14 year old on the planet, you know, practically at this point, certainly in, in developed nations at this point, um, you know, without So in other words, people are making linkages where they don't exist, basically. Right. right. Makes sense. And I imagine that there's this desperate grasping for causal explanations, too, in those cases when there's such a tragedy yeah, and something that might on the surface appear to be connected um, doesn't necessarily mean it is. So tell me this. So I, I'll share, you know, my own video game experience. Mm -hmm. I grew up in I was born in the 80s. So I grew up in the 90s and played a lot on like Super Nintendo. And so Super Mario Brothers and Donkey Kong and those types of games. 
And then I got caught up in all the sports games, all the EA sports games, Madden, NBA 2K. My friends and I, that's what we would play. That was our thing. And so that's been the majority of my video gaming. And so I don't have much personal experience with violent video games. Granted, I remember my brother and I playing some Grand Theft Auto for sure as, you know, 12, 13 years old. Um, but I don't have a clear sense of how, of what the most extreme level of violent is in video games. So maybe you can explain that to me and other listeners who, who also don't know. How, how gruesome and intense does it get? Yeah. Um, most, so what we have are, I think what we usually call AAA titles, which means that these are titles that are produced by mainstream video game companies that you will be able to buy, uh, you know, if you went to, you know, Best Buy or Target or Walmart or places like that, you'll, you'll find these on the shelf. Okay. Um, and they're, they have a rating on them. So, and I, if I thought of it, I would have brought like a video game that could have showed you the, where on the box where they have the rating. So if you buy a physical copy, which is becoming rare, but if you buy a physical copy, you'll see right on the box, it'll have an age rating. It's the ESRB rating system, Entertainment Software Ratings Board rating system. And it gives you a rough age estimate of what, you know, how, what they think is appropriate, you know. So it's very similar to the movies, you know. So, you know, what you have at the top end of what are called AAA games, those, those will mostly top out a rating called M for Mature, which is the same thing as an R-rated movie. And the content you can expect is probably about consistent with an R-rated movie. So, you know, within that range, you, you even there, you get some range. So, you know, I remember even when my son was a bit younger, he's 17 now, so he can watch whatever he wants. <laughs> but uh, but when he was a bit younger, you know, uh, even like maybe like 12 or so, we would sometimes let him watch some R-rated movies. Uh, and I remember Prometheus, like, which is one of the alien movies, basically the alien series we would let him watch because it's just mm-hmm. like monster squids, you know, and that kind of stuff. Uh, there wasn't really anything terribly offensive in it other than that, as far as we were concerned. And, we, you know, I'd already seen them and my wife probably seen most of them um but on the other hand you know thinking of like you know was it was the quentin tarantino movie the i forget what it was uh recently um the hateful eight that's what i'm trying to think of like i would not have let my kids see the hateful eight uh because that also includes a lot of like you know sexual material and 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 whatever else that which just wasn't the conversation i was ready to have about some of that stuff with the you know, 12 year old boy or, or something like that. So, so, so even within R, I mean, you want to keep an eye out, like, you know, again, right. the aliens fine, but April 8 isn't a mm. war shit out of Compton is not, you know, whatever. I've been trying to yeah. think of it's off the top of my head, but it's the same thing. Like, you know, Halo is an M rated game and Grand Theft Auto is an M rated game. Halo is just, you're shooting, you know, aliens and they have blue blood and stuff. So that's that. I don't think Halo is a big deal at all. We're supposed to, Grand Theft Auto does have some sexual material in it. So, you, you, again, if you're a typical American parent like me, you're, I'm more worried about the sexual stuff than the violence. So they can, my kid can shoot you know, aliens all he wants. I don't really care, but I don't want to have to, at, when he's like 11, explain what a prostitute is necessarily okay. um, and that sort of thing. You know? um, but other than that, no, it's, I mean, you kind of think of like the worst R-rated movie you can think of, and it's probably about that. Mm -hmm. you know um at the top end of m rated games Uh now what you know people should keep in mind is that you know that i'm talking about triple a games here so there is a category called adults only which is ao which is one above m it's mostly for porn um so there are porn games out there Mm. (laughs) so it's mostly like literal porn you know so it's the same thing as an x well there's there's no like official x rating but you Mm -hmm. know uh but it's the same same idea as an x rated movie um, but keep in mind, I mean, now with online platforms like Steam and things like that, some guy in his basement in Russia can make a video game and release it online, you know, and that's not a triple A game, but right. he can still sell it, you know. And so there have been a few of these like really offensive kind of games that have popped up and, you know, um, and be some, again, some guy in Russia decides to like do a game about like the Columbine massacre where you can play as one of the like school shooters or something like that. I mean, obviously, right. most people find that to be obviously, yeah, you know, ab- outside of what we call the Overton window. It's, uh, it's obviously mm-hmm. offensive. Um, Did that really it, it wasn't like Activision didn't do this game. So people will sometimes ask, well, how can pe- how could video game companies make a game like this? They didn't. Some right. guy in Russia made it. <laughs> and that, that, that's a real example right there that really happened? I forget. It. There have been games that have been like that. So there, there have been sort of school shooter themed games. I think there was one game that was like, 
you could play as the assassin during the JFK assassination and things like that. So, you know, it's bad taste. He's, you know, they both would say it's a bad taste. Um, you mm-hmm. know, but again, it wasn't like Atari, you know, uh, developed this game right. or Sony or something like that. It yeah. was some guy in, you know, it always ends up being Russia. I don't know what's up with Russia, but um, but some guy in Russia in his basement, one, like one or two guys, and they decide to like, What's going to piss people off so much? It'll get tons of attention and people will buy this, even though it's a crappy game, just to see what the fuss is all about. That's the marketing scheme. You know? So what they yeah. do is they come up with an incredibly offensive idea, get it onto Steam or another online platform, or just sell it on their website, and then make sure Fox News hears about it, and then Fox News will sell it for them you know, by creating outrage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then <laughs> people are suckers. So you know, all you need to do is generate an international outrage for a week or so, and these guys are raking couple hundred thousand dollars from curious people will buy a stupid game just to see what the fuss is mm. you know if you just it's a streisand effect right you know if you had just kept your mouth shut then nobody would have known about the game nobody would have bought it mm. um you know so it's a very specific marketing approach <laughs> to making games and make a crappy move a crappy game that's super offensive and then let the dollars rake in for like a week before all the like steam and stuff like eventually will shut it down but right interesting uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and I imagine that, you know, your, the data you are analyzing does not include any games like that. I, I wouldn't imagine that there is yeah, much data about the effects of those types of games. Well, it's very rare to come across a kid that's played at. Right. That the reality of it. So we do have databases of kids where they list like the, the, the games they play. I've mm-hmm. never seen one of these games pop up okay. once. Yeah. Uh, maybe. I mean, what, the one that came the closest is what the heck was that game? Po- Postal. I think it comes up occasionally, you know, not anymore, but it was just from like the earlier 2000s and it was a satire game. So it was basically a game with satiring the whole uh, concept of debate about media violence and stuff. And it did it by, of course, like being way over the top in mm-hmm. terms of like, you know, how violent it was, a stupid level of violence. And again, most kids never came across it. Uh, maybe, you know, out of a, trying to think we had a sample of over a thousand kids once i can't remember if even a single kid reported playing postal mm. if it was it was one or two out of a thousand something like that so very very rare um mm-hmm. but you still get these big freak outs over like oh my god you know is your kid playing postal you know no because it's not at walmart <laughs> you know they, they'd have to somehow get out of there go out of their way uh, to get access to this game you know you're not going to walk into target and accidentally buy a school shooter for your kid Right. You know, or something right. Sort of. They have to go on the internet and find it, you right. know, to access it. And they're not going to get it for free. You know, mm-hmm. So it's still going to cost money somehow. So they need a credit card and a savvy internet search, you know, ability in order to find most of these games. Mm. Yeah. When you think, so there's a few questions that come to my mind and I'll just mention them both partly so that I don't forget. One is, would you go as far to say that violent video games can actually deter violence? And then the other question that we'll get to after is about the future of violent video gaming. And especially as it gets incorporated into virtual reality gaming, what what you predict around that. But first, the first question, um, would you go as far to say that violent video games could deter actual violence? Yeah, so you're, you're referencing the catharsis theory. It's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, yeah, yeah. The idea. So, and it's important to point out there's a distinction between what we think as being catharsis theory. So with catharsis theory, basically you have an emotion and what you do is you then try to find a safe outlet for it. You know, so it sort of burns off. And it's, there, there's, there's some evidence to suggest this kind of works, at least like this, there's this hydraulic model of like sexuality, right? The idea that if you haven't had sex for a while, your motivation goes up. And then you have sex or you masturbate or something like that. And then the motivation goes down for a while and then it goes back up. So that's kind of like the same idea, only now applying that to like, you know, anger uh, and such. And so you hear people will say like, I'm angry, so I'm going to go punch a pillow, you know, uh, for a while. Um, that's been a very controversial idea. It was, again, with social modeling, it really went out of favor. Um, I think there's now some evidence to suggest that actually catharsis at least kind of works, um, you know, for at least for some people. So it's not, it really got a bad name for a while. I think that bad name was again, more ideological than it was database necessarily. So I think what you could say is that probably catharsis works better than doing nothing um, Mm -hmm. at this point, you know, rather than sort of ruminating catharsis actually is probably better. What works better than catharsis though is what's called mood management. Uh, So mood management, instead of trying to give vent to your anger, you actually try to switch your mood entirely. 
uh, which means that you do something that relaxes you, you know, so you do something fun. Uh, now, it turns out violent video games are actually pretty good at that, you know, so you kind of think of it as being a hard activity. What, it, what violent video games actually seem to do, or nonviolent video games, all video games seem to do is, is for people who enjoy them, it relaxes them. Uh, so it's not exactly catharsis, but it still may work in more or less the same sort of way that you have a bad day, you come home, you play a game you find to be fun. That's, the, that's really the key element. That's not the content. It's the experiencing mm-hmm. fun. If you're having fun, uh, then that usually distracts you from your anger, your depression, or whatever your negative mood is and makes you mm-hmm. feel better. So in that sense, I think you know, there is some evidence to suggest that, like, like any other hobby, you know, right. gaming, including violent gaming, uh, can be effective uh, in that sense. The the other wrinkle on this, I think, is kind of neat, and this again comes, you know, particularly from some of Patrick Markey's work uh, and other people. Other people, this has been confirmed, maybe at least five or six studies at this point, um, is that uh, there's another theory that comes out of criminal justice, which is called routine activities theory, and this theory basically says that if you have a popular ba- population of individuals that's highly prone to aggression or violent crime, like young males, and you give them something else to do. By simple virtual of taking time away from them, they have less time to engage in violent crime. Uh, it's kind of the theory behind why people put like basketball courts in inner city, uh, lower income inner city neighborhoods and that kind of stuff. You give them something positive to do, they'll, they'll have less time to do something negative. Um, so with some of the work that's most of this in the United States, there was one study out of the, the Netherlands. I'm trying to think if there's one now that was someplace else. Um, but there have been a, a handful, again, maybe five or six studies that find that uh, and you find the same thing with violent movies, by the way, um, that when a highly popular violent video game is released like Grand Theft Auto V back in 2013 um, or any of the Call of Duty series or that kind of stuff, that violent crime in the United States goes down immediately. Uh, there's an immediate decline um, hmm. in the incident, like, like that next day uh, and such, which suggests that all of these sort of like highly violent prone young males are now kind of like to capitalize on the on the stereotype you mentioned earlier on is they're they're all sitting in their basements playing Grand Theft Auto rather than running around you know mugging little old ladies and that kind of stuff. So you know, I guess maybe a little bit simplistic way of thinking of it, but that is the idea: is if you give people something positive to do, they have less time uh, to do something more uh, more negative. Um, mm. So there seems to be some evidence, you know, that um, because of the timing, this is all with these like time series designs. Uh, it's not just it's not just a correlation. It's still correlational data, but it's you know a little bit more sophisticated than just mm-hmm. a correlation because they're looking at the sequence of time very specifically. Um, but at least that sort of hint toward a certain causality there that these games are sort of stopping people from engaging in um, negative behaviors at least for a short period of time after their immediate um, you know release. So so yeah, I mean to some extent. Um, I, I would say they probably are net positive rather than net negative. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And then uh, g- we'll, we'll get to that question about the future, but one that's coming up now is just basically what do you think the unique draw of violence in the video games is like, what is the psychological satisfaction of that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think it's anything unique to video games. I mean, you know, violent entertainment has been yeah. around since it's been entertainment. I mean, the I think the earliest, you know, I'm not a literature expert, but if I remember correctly, the earliest recorded piece of literature is the Epic of Gilgamesh, I think, which is filled with violence, you know, and sex, <laughs> um, you know. So, uh, you know, even a lot of religious texts like the Bible, the Hindu Ramayana, you know, have considerable violence and sex, um, you know, in them. Um, so these seem to be things that have appealed to us uh, as long as we've been able to produce art. Um, you know, to, to some extent, cave drawings have violence in them and sex, actually. Yeah, the, the ones they show you on PBS are, the, are a snippet of <laughs> what is actually available on some of these caves. Right. G rated <laughs> cave paintings on PBS. They yeah, are edited, centered cave painting. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I've seen the other ones. <laughs> mm. uh, I talk about them a little bit in my media and behavior classes, like actual mm. cave paintings, I've never seen anthropology classes. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, so this seems to be just like stuff it's, it's probably part of the human condition, you know, so we are an aggressive species. Um, that's how we treat each other. Again, this, we have a horrible history. A lot of it's very negative. It's also part of partly part of why we're successful, uh, is reality. So it's a success that obviously comes with a horrible cost in terms of, you know, a, a lot of misbehavior. Um, but on the other hand, it's probably evolutionarily adaptive, you know? Um, so, um, that is, you know, Critters, human critters that were uh, able to 
produced sort of a moderate level of aggression, probably did better than those that either were too aggressive or those that weren't aggressive at all. And that, that means that as a consequence, a certain amount of appeal towards aggression or aggressive topics is probably hardwired into us. And, and particularly more as males um, than as females. You know, mm-hmm. males have always historically been much highly, much more highly involved in violence and aggression than, than females. Um, females can be very socially aggressive, but they usually aren't as involved in physical aggression mm-hmm. um, as, as, as males are. So that's also probably why men tend to like violent entertainment more than do women. Of course, there are some women that love violent video games, that love violent movies and that kind of stuff too. So I don't want to be too gender stereotyping, but, uh, but you do, you do generally see like, you know, for like the first person shooter genre of video games that has much more highly uh, male activity than female, uh, even though gaming in general is more, you know, more diverse in terms of gender. Um, but um, yeah, so yeah, I think some of that is just sort of wired into us. We're, we're interested in that, whether it's the news, whether it's sports, you know, whether it's television, video games, novels, mm-hmm. even our religious texts have got it in it. So it just seems to be something that we are wired to be interested in because it's probably part of our condition. I think most of us, particularly in the modern era, don't really want to be directly exposed to it. Um, some people do, uh, but most of us, I, I would like hide under a rock. God forbid I was ever like recruited into an army or something like that. I would be the worst soldier ever, but um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> You know, so, um, uh, yeah, (laughs) so, but, but it's still sort of like, you know, wired in there somewhere. So I love war movies. I love horror movies and the stuff. I, you know, I love reading history and particularly I like, like military history, you know, so I love reading and, 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 uh, and watching a lot of the stuff. I wouldn't want to watch people in real life actually get hurt. I don't watch boxing or things like that, but mm. you know, in terms of, you know, sort of like when I eat meat, I don't want to actually like, hunt the thing. I want the, like the plausible deniability you know, around it. I don't want to watch an actual person get beat up, but, uh, but, uh, you know, but if I know for sure it's fictional, then it's actually kind of entertaining and fun. Yeah. Um, but, um, but other people do like, like MMA and boxing right. and, uh, and even hockey and, and other, you know, other things too. So some people still are attracted to that. So I admit I'm one of them. What's that? I admit I'm one of them. I, I watch MMA them. and I love <laughs> football and, and, and I think that there is still, interesting boundaries around that though there's there's lines that i would never want to see crossed like yeah. when i i remember when i saw mike tyson bite evander holyfield's oh, ear yeah. off that was that. disgusting yeah. i went from being entertained and intrigued to disgusted yeah. and it was because there's there was a line that was crossed where it became like it's all it's all violent but under this context of consent really yeah. mm-hmm. and then when that line gets crossed it's I don't like seeing that, of course. Um, yeah. And and I, I yeah, I would never be able to watch even even movies. Like I think about what what move violent movies have actually bothered me to where it was like cringy. I I couldn't really handle it. And there's not much. Like even just the other night, I was doing some work and threw a movie on in the background, and the movie was Road Rage featuring Russell Crowe. Hadn't even heard of it. Saw it on available. Oh, yeah. Watched yeah. it. And it's very violent. He's just this crazed, enraged person, and it's super violent. But it didn't it didn't disturb me. But in movies where where they show torture, mm. that or and I mean movies, I, I've never really. I mean, no, no, there's movies that show rape as well. Like I'm thinking of um, oh my gosh, the movie the dragon, the girl with the dragon tattoo. I remember oh, that one. There was. Mm-hmm. There was a rape scene in it that disgusted me. It was hard to get that out of my mind, really. So that that's what what's hard for me. But mm-hmm. it but it don't it doesn't seem like there's video games with those two elements. Unless uh, and mm-hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, vi- v- um, rape and torture. Not triple A, yeah, right. not, not certainly not. Well, I mean, so like a few a few triple A uh, uh, games might have some torture scenes in them. So. Um, I'm thinking of again, Grand Theft Auto Five did have a torture sequence, uh, and, and I think it was probably the most controversial part of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of, in part because a lot of gamers one didn't find it fun, um, and because it's not because it's not it's not fun. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I didn't find it fun. I played through the sequence. Uh, it's like it's like literally boring, you know, in a way, yeah. but also at the same time, sort of like morally disturbing in, mm-hmm. in a way, kind of like forced. And, and in fairness, the character that you play in that particular scene seems to share that ambivalence you know so it's communicating in a way like the character also is kind of being pushed into it um but also seems if i remember correctly also seems to share some of the ambivalence about what he's doing 
Mm. Um, but still, it was kind of like mm, you threw this in there to get some news or you know mm. coverage. I think, yeah. right. but that's, that's very uncommon. You know, this yeah. is, not rape. I've, I don't. I've never seen a. They again, like any form of media, they might cover the topic of rape. You mm-hmm. know, so right. So a character might have been raped, mm-hmm. uh, and that's part of her or maybe his backstory or something of that sort. So it may it may deal with a topic of it, but I've never seen a AAA, including Grand Theft Auto um, series, actually have you play out a rape scene or give you the option of of raping someone or, or anything mm-hmm. of that sort. Again, yeah. I haven't played through every game in the world, so there may right. be exceptions, but I just haven't heard about AAA. Because again, I mean, what is the audience for that? I mean, right. you know, these these people want to sell games, right. you know, and this a game where you get to simulate rape. I mean, I, I would like to be optimistic enough to think the audience for that is very small, right? And uh, you would turn off far more potential players with that than you would ever attract um, yeah. with that sort of thing. So I don't. Mm. Again, are, are there like games on the internet that some guy in Russia, I keep thinking of Russia, but some guy in Russia, I mean, maybe, you know, um, but those are s- small games, niche games that are angling for Fox News to learn about them so that they'll advertise them for them. So, yeah, <laughs> but right. no, no, this, I mean, it's funny because I actually have some friends from, from high school who one time asked me about that because they had a teen, they had a, he must be an adult now, but at the time he's a teenage son and. He had downloaded Grand Theft Auto V without, in fairness, without letting him know. So he was in some trouble. Uh, but they asked that, like, they were like, I went, we went online. We read that there's like child sex abuse and like rape and necrophilia in the game. I was like, I, I missed it. <laughs> if that was the case, I, yeah, I played the game and it, I didn't see anything like that in there. But I mean, if you, but if you think about it, like, what is the, I, you know, how many, even if you think your audience is adult males or teen males, how many of these people want to play out child sexual abuse? I, I think that's a pretty small group of people that would find that even remotely fun or just not so disgusting that they would not want to play any part of the game if they learned that was in it, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I'm up, op- I'm optimistic in that way too. Um, would you ever, would you ever support some type of regulatory agency that would ensure that that never gets put into games or that if it's on an online game that that gets banned? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tricky question because I'm, I'm a pretty free speech, you know. I mean, I think a lot of these things are going to be handled in the marketplace, you know. Mm. So what's going to happen is that if ever Activision, I'm picking Activision, if ever they were dumb enough to release a game with that kind of content, and first off, it would never get rated as anything short of an AO, which is going to take it right off of most shelves, you know. Um, I don't know if Steam would carry it, but certainly like Walmart, Target, Best Buy, all the brick and mortar stores are not going to carry a game. Mm. Um, that is is uh, rated AO. Um, Steam might. I don't remember their policies around AO games. Um, but then, you know, so there's this idea of the Overton window. So the Overton window is this idea that there's cert- some things that you, are like third rails that if you touch this thing, you die. You know, basically. You know, so in some cases, if you do something that's outrageous, you'll get a uh, you know the Barbara Streisand effect where people kind of uh, they won't have heard of it before until they see it. You know, and then they'll the flock to it and you can get that benefit up until a point but if you cross too far over into it people will just will flip on you and there are certain ta- absolute taboos and anything involving child sexual abuse or anything like that um or i think you know i know there's a lot of talk about like rape culture but i think i'm optimistic here and say that anything where you get like you know simulate a rape scenario or something of like that sort would clearly be over the top for your mm-hmm. average young male uh, video gamer and you would lose the massive audience share. So, so I think that the market itself, I'm going to sound like a libertarian here. I'm not really a libertarian, but uh, I think in this case, the, the market would take care of most of that. Mm-hmm. Um, the wariness I have, I mean, certainly, you know, <laughs> I think we would probably agree that this is stuff that doesn't belong in games, but, um, but the wariness I have is the second you say, well, we'll start here. We'll ban this stuff. Then someone's going to say, well, well, what about this stuff? You know, this stuff's kind of bad too, right? right? You know, oh yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of bad too. You know, so you know, what about if you had like some, I don't know, like the, the depictions of, of race in a game wasn't totally you know on par with 
you know, the progressive sort of view of what, you know, well, all right. Well, mm-hmm. well, you know what? There's no trans individuals in that game. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, so it's not a very diverse game, is it? You know, so, uh, you know, and eventually, you know, there are a lot of good, a lot of worthy causes. You know, I'm not opposed to any of the causes I just mentioned. Right. I think we should have diversity. Right. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to, that's, that's the slippery slope argument. I, I know people don't like the slippery slope argument. Usually the people that don't like the slippery slope argument are the ones who are greasing a slope. <laughs> <laughs> so so but so i think there is a sense of like yeah yes i mean there, there are obviously yeah, free speech is never entirely absolute um but we want to be kind of careful about inviting the government in um to some of these things when i'm actually pretty confident the market would take care of most of this stuff you're going to get so much outrage if you had a game where you simulated like child molestation like that the outrage over that you know from left and right would be so massive and from mm. gamers would be so massive that we'd know we defending it mm. and um i think that would take care of it you know good, uh, good, the, good the platforms uh, just from the outrage will steam steam is pretty open-minded but if there's enough outrage steam will take a game off mm. you just won't be able to get it mm. you know, so you, uh, yeah yeah so have you played virtual reality? Have you had the virtual reality headset yet? Virtual reality is awesome. Isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely awesome. Yes, it is. Oh, uh, best game, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a, this is a, a non, uh, non-financially non remunerated uh, uh, recommendation. And okay. that is the Star Wars Squadrons in VR. Amazing experience. Uh, you know what? My friend, his name is also <laughs> Nick. That was my first experience on the VR headset yeah. was that game. Okay. And he brought it over and he knew what he was doing. He had it all set up so that I could simply put the goggles on and it was ready to go. And yeah. it, it blew my mind really. Like the way your brain can be tricked in, into feeling like that's real is quite yeah. amazing. That game is it's a fantastic game. It's kind of a short game, but it's a fantastic game. And uh, they did an excellent job in programming mm. VR, uh, you know, in that. I've had mixed experience with VR games. I've played other games as well. Uh, my other probably next favorite one was is Resident Evil 7. So if you like the Resident Evil series, it was probably the best of the Resident Evil series, in my opinion. Um, and uh, they did a really nice job with the VR there as well. There's, you know, because in that case, it's not just spacious, but other like human characters. And there's mm. particularly early on where the main character is kind of interacting with his wife. It's almost like, Wow, I could like reach out and touch her hair. Wow, and stuff. you know, it just seems so real, uh, mm. and it's really impressive. But uh, but what I really like about Star Wars Squadrons is so uh, we've actually we have done a few studies with with the VR. Uh, we do tend to find about ten percent of people still get what's called simulator sickness with from VR, which is what it sounds like. You know, they start getting nauseous or headaches from it. Um, I've had mixed experiences. So with Resident Evil Seven. I could usually probably play it for about an hour. And if it was much more than an hour, I would start to get headaches um, and stuff like that. And I've had other games where I just felt terrible uh, after playing them, even for short periods of time. But Star Wars Squadron, I could play by for like three or four hours and never get any simulated sickness. Mm. So something about how they programmed it, they really programmed mm. it well to uh, avoid all the kind of like downsides of, of uh, VR. So, But, mm. but no, if you, if you ever have a chance to, you know, and I know you, you played it, but so, so to speak, I, to the audience now, but yeah. if, if you have a chance to play some VR games, uh, take it up. It's an it's an amazing experience. Indeed, it is. And and you know what's funny is my, it's it's literally part of my exercise routine to VR box. Okay. I just have this simple it's, like I forget the game's called Ready for the Fight, and okay. you're just boxing, right? <laughs> but I'm literally throwing punches as hard as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we all know boxers are some of the most you know, beautiful physiques you'll ever see. And yeah. so it's just, it's really good exercise and I love it. And it's so fun. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to VR, given how real it can seem, what is your thinking around violence in the VR realm? And will that impact be any different? And what will the evolution of this look like? I'm curious about all your thoughts. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a couple, and I, I mean that very literally, as far as I know, two uh, studies of, of virtual reality, uh, at least in the last couple of years. Um, both of them are pre-registered. I was I was involved with both of them. One was actually led by uh, a, a couple of colleagues of mine, uh, Aaron Drummond and, and Jim Sauer, who are over in Australia, New Zealand. And so I was kind of like a lesser part of that one. Um, the other one was at our lab at Stetson University. Uh, so with myself and some students that had done with that one. Uh, both of them are pre-registered, uh, you know, so hopefully held to somewhat higher standard of evidence. 
Um, and neither of them found any evidence of, of violence in VR games led to any aggression or any other negative outcomes and stuff. So, um, so I mean, I, I think, I mean, obviously with the question, I think you're kind of getting at is this idea of like, is more realism going to be associated with, with like more effects or that kind of thing? Yeah. And, and I don't think so. I, I think that like what, what seems to be kind of key here, because we, we kind of heard this like argument over the last century from like radio to movies and movies to television and television mm -hmm. to video games and then video games to VR. Um, and kind of augmented AR kind of thrown in there as well, augmented reality, uh, like Pokemon Go. Mm. Um, you see some similar kind of arguments, but it seems to be that as long as people understand that what they're doing is fictional, that's what, that's all that matters, you know. Mm. Uh, so that is like a weird binary that as long as a person's brain understands they're engaging or, or you know with a fictional universe, then they don't treat the learning experience like they would the real world. And no matter how otherwise realistic it might be they still know it's fictional. And that seems to be the key thing. Now, if you were to, you know, be able to do like the Truman show, you mm -hmm. know, and somehow like raise a baby in VR without ever telling that person they were in VR, you know, maybe then, you know, that might work, you know, but barring that sort of circumstance where the person doesn't know that they're in VR, um, that it doesn't look like, you know, simply the realism or the immersive nature of the experience necessarily changes how we learn or don't learn from that experience. It simply mm -hmm. seems to be that, you know, um, you know, you can't think of like Star Wars Squadrons again, you know, you're in a spaceship being shot at by other spaceships, you know, and shooting them back, you know, in the game, it was like, I feel like I'm in an X-Wing or whatever, it feels like a lot of fun. If you put me in an actual plane and had other planes shoot at me, I'd be petrified, I'd be traumatized, you know, so, you know, so it's still a very different experience because we know that I'm going to get off the chair in a second, go right. have lunch, you know, no matter what happens in the context of the game. The worst, and it, it did happen to me a few times, the worst might happen to me, it might be frustrated because I can't complete the mission because I'm mm -hmm. so sucky at piloting an X-Wing. Um, you know, so I've, I've had those moments, <laughs> but, but that's, that's on me or anything else. But yeah, no, so does, we don't seem to see any evidence that, these are both experimental studies, you know, so we don't seem to see much to suggest that. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Yeah. yeah, there's any like increased influence for VR uh, over traditional video games in terms of having an impact on aggression. So, so it was good news. Yeah. Yeah, so. indeed. And and so I, I'm just kind of highlighting your statement that the the key is that the the person knows it's fictional. Mm -hmm. um, it it does make me wonder. It's just a spontaneous thought here that whether that line is equally clear for everybody or for everyone at different stages of development that perhaps a kid could know it's fictional and that they report that, yes, I know this is fictional, but it, but the realism is off the charts for them to the mm -hmm. point where the line is a little bit blurry between fictional and real. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's possible. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, there've been there've been a host of you know, like really interesting studies that were done again sort of the early two thousands and two thousand teens. I'm, I'm sure they're still ongoing, but I haven't really touched base with them in a while. But um, where they're kind of looking at like how kids develop reality testing, right? You know, so and uh, I remember like there was like the study about like the candy witch or this kind of stuff. They had all these like so what they would do is they would they would take these kids and expose them to different types of information to see if they bought it. You know, um, so I remember in some of them, they would take, tell like kids about like a new species of dragon that was found. And like in, in some cases, they would give the kids the, a, that story in a book that was obviously a book of fairy tales. And the other kids, they would give it in a book that was obviously like a science book. You know what I mean? So and like with, with, with that matter to kids like that. And so we tend to find is that, you know, before the age of three, Kids are kind of dumb. I mean, they just, they just believe whatever you tell them, you know. Um, you know, we're both parents. So we got to know this sort of thing, right? You know, uh, And we were both kids one day. So, you know, one, right. long ago for me, not so long ago for you. But, um, you know, and, and being about age three seems to be when it starts. So being in about age three, kids begin to develop over a course of about nine or ten years uh, reality testing. And it doesn't come on like a light switch, right? So kids kind of get better at it over time. So at first... You know, you can take a three or four year old and say like, hey, I saw a dragon, you know, and they'll be like, no, you didn't. And, you know, whatever. But they'll be, they'll be intrigued, but they'll, mm -hmm. they'll kind of like doubt it, you know. Um, and what you tend to find is like with the earlier kids, like younger kids, they do this kind of like con like source monitoring, you know. So if you tell them the dragon exists, 
in a fairy tale, they're like, nah, that's a fairy tale book, you know. But if you put it in like their kindergarten science book or whatever, like, well, it was in a science book. So, you know, mm. uh, supposed to, you know, my teacher told me this thing, mm-hmm. so it must be true, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and then by about age 11, 12, 13, usually kids begin to shift into abstract reasoning, which means that they no longer believe anything anybody tells them. You know, they start to try to reason things out. And you can see this with Santa Claus, right? It's the prime example of this, that early kids just believe it. <laughs> and which is interesting too, because you have like everybody lies to kids, right? You know, so that about Santa Claus, like literally their parents, their teachers, the television, their politicians, everybody is lying to children about Santa Claus. I don't know what message this tells kids, but, you know, but big, massive, you want to hear about societal conspiracies? This is a societal conspiracy (laughs) is to convince children that Santa Claus is real. Everybody lies to them about this stuff. And what's fascinating about that is that usually even by like the latter elementary, like about eight, nine, 10, even they're starting to like figure out something's wrong. Right. This isn't this isn't making sense. Like, how does he get all the kids in one night? You know, how does he come down the chimney? We don't have a chimney. You know, does he have like a key or something? You know, we I remember like my son one time asking, like, we moved and like, how does he know where we are now? And we had to be like, well, we sent him a forwarding address. And this, you know, <laughs> um, so you kind of see them starting to like process, like, even though I keep being told this thing is true, I'm not so sure anymore. And then usually by, again, 11, 12, 13, it's you know, it, it's done. The reality, in fact, like quite literally, by the time of the average person, I think is 12, reality testing is done. It's it. You don't get any better. You know, like literally a 50 year old like me has about the same reality testing as a 12 year old does, you know, which is bad, say, kind of bad, but you know, it doesn't just, but it's, you know, an adult level of reality testing. Right. You know, people are still suckered all the time, but, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but it's just not going to get any better than that, you know. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, so there, there are always these sense of, of like, you know, you do kind of want to be a little bit careful about, you know, what you show younger kids, I think, you know, um, not so much in terms of like, it's going to turn them into like murderers, you know, right. but in terms of it may be traumatizing. Right. You know, I, I, I shouldn't even use the word traumatizing because that word gets abused, you know. No but, doubt. It makes them anxious, you know, yeah. short-term anxiety, you know, they might have a short-term anxiety response, you know, to something, you know, so yeah. because they may not be able to like, like an animal gets killed in a movie, mm. you know, they, you know, it might be hard to convince them that, oh yeah, but the, no, no dog actually got killed, you know, in the making of this movie, as they say now, right. right. You know, right. Uh, they may, they may find that to be upsetting um, because they sort of, you know, what's the word for it? Um, you know, I don't know. They, they, they've, you know, anim- animated this, this, fictional dog in their minds and they're, they're mm. having difficulty separating the reality of that but we're talking about like kindergartners you know right. from, like very 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 young kids that are that are kind of at that level mm. um, for the most part so so you know I, again i don't think if you showed your you know let your kid play grand theft auto when they were, were five that they would turn into a murderer or become more aggressive or violent do i think it's the best idea ever no but you know um, but I, but I think we tend to exaggerate, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the consequences of, mm. uh, of something like that. But, but also I think just because of the content of that, of that particular game is so adult that it was just sort of like morally strange, you know, to let, you know, a kid right. that young have, have content to it. So that's the other thing I think too, for parents is, is the sense of like, even if we sort of, there's a difference between, you know, sort of like moral, uh, maybe repugnance is too strong a word, but it you a know, moral disapproval of something. And the belief that it is like scientifically linked to negative outcomes. So you can still not like something morally, even if it doesn't necessarily cause like homicide. That's a good you know, point. You know, so you can decide like, you know, as, as the makers of the game will tell you that Grand Theft Auto was made for adults, you know, and it has content in there that is kind of, you know, societally appropriate for adults. And if you don't want your seven year old um, to, to have access to it, that's fine. That's yeah. your decision. Right. As, a, as, a, as a parent and and I would support it you know like I said I don't, I don't think I would have been enthused to try to explain what a prostitute was to my five-year-old kid right. um, that's more of a like 13 year old conversation mm-hmm. you know I guess you know whatever mm-hmm. age people want to have it um, but um, you know yeah so that, that's I think that's you know that, that's kind of the difference and people sometimes have trouble making that difference of like I don't like this thing morally therefore it must be harmful those are two very separate questions you know that may be true or may not be true you know, and uh, just, just, I think it helps us to remember that it, at least in terms of like media effect, fictional media effects, 
it oftentimes isn't true. Mm. That's a that's a key point, I think, in your whole argument here. That's that's helpful to understand that. that and I see that distinction. I see what you mean, definitely. Okay, well, I, I told my son, as I mentioned, that I would ask a question on his behalf. And so I'll, I'll set the stage a little bit. So for his, you know, his recent or Christmas recently, I, I got him a Super Nintendo. Nice. And there's this cool, you know, game shop with some, a lot of vintage stuff and got him a Super Nintendo and some classic games, Super Mario Brothers and Donkey Kong. Mm-hmm. And it's been just great fun for me and definitely for him. And so that's been wonderful. And then he also plays Minecraft along okay. with so many kids nowadays. Mm-hmm. And it's been very, very interesting to see the different effects that these have, not not at all related to impacting his like potential violent behavior, but just on his, on, more on like a video game addiction level. And mm-hmm. I know this is a, kind of a separate topic and perhaps we can have a part three conversation and get into video game addiction, but... Yeah. Um, but in terms of his ability to stop without any drama and without negotiating and pushing back and asking for more time with, with the super Nintendo games, it's seamless. It's just like, let me just, all right, I'll, I'll let you finish this level and then we're done. And he's like, always okay with that. Minecraft is designed very differently. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the game and listeners maybe as well. And essentially, there's no like clear moment where you can really take a break or pause or end. There's no, it's not like you cross the finish line like in Super Mario Brothers. And, the, and that makes it very difficult for kids to kind of stop playing all of a sudden because it always feels like there's this one more thing that right. I'm just gonna, about to do. Um, so, so, so basically, my, my question is, what are your views about Minecraft, given the, the, the hold that it has taken uh, in society? And what are your views on Minecraft? And then maybe just a nugget or two about how you have helped yourself, your kids, people in general, of keep video game play in some form of moderation. Yeah, those are, those are some great questions. Um, so I, I never took to Minecraft myself. My son is like yours. My son, not so much anymore, but, you know, uh, I don't know what, what age your son is. But um, but when my son was particularly like uh, in like late elementary, middle, early high school, he loved Minecraft. It was all he would talk about. And, you know, that was like his you know, wake up in the morning and go to bed at night, you know, game, you know, basically. But yeah, so w- these kind of games that they're world building games, you know, mm-hmm. and Minecraft, of course, you know, is a very specific genre where you actually like literally build a world. Um, but all these kind of like world building games have that element to them of them never ending. <laughs> so so I don't know if you've ever played like Civilization is also kind of like well known for, although it's a very different game from Minecraft. Uh, and uh, all of the uh, paradox games like Europa Universalis and the Hearts of Iron and all that kind of stuff. That's the same thing. It's just, it's, you know, a, you know, a game may take a hundred hours in some cases, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but you don't want to play them all together. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. know, you know, take, take a civilization from beginning to end, you know, or if you want to run Germany during World War II to take it from 1936 or whatever, I forget what year they started. I think it's 36, you know, to 19, or maybe go to 1955 or so, depending on how long the war goes. Um, you know, um, it, it, yeah, it doesn't, it's, there's no, like, you know, there's no chapters, you know, you know right. it's just okay. ongoing decisions after decisions. And it is very tempting that you make some decisions and you want to see over time how they turn out. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, but by the time you see how those turn out, you made three or four other decisions. Right. And so it's always kind of, you know, kept you going. So that, that genre is kind of known for having that issue of, of like, it's just, there's not a stopping point. You don't ever, you can, you can save it anytime you want and sure. go away, but there's always a sense of like, Oh, I just want to see how one or two more things turn out before I stop. And by that point, you've already got one or two more things. You want to see how they turn out before you stop. Um, yeah. I mean, so it, it can be, it can be kind of tricky, you know, uh, in that sense, it sounds like you're already kind of doing some of the right stuff with the other games. Like, you know, one of the things like I have parents uh, complain about is for gaming in general. So I'll say like, I'll go into my kid's room and tell him to stop playing. And he gets angry and said, well, did you give him a 10 minute warning? No. Okay. Well, you need to give him a 10 minute warning, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, you know, something yeah. that, range, you know, because oftentimes they're playing socially, 
right. you know, with another child or other children, you know, and if you sort of like, if someone, you know, I'm going to exaggerate this a little, this is a bit of hyperbole, but sort of like, you know, um, someone fell off a ledge and you're holding on to them and you're the only thing to keep them from dropping. And your parent comes and says, you know, can you let go of him? We got to go get your, I don't know, haircut, something like that. You know, it's, it's not, obviously that's hyperbole, but it's that it's, it's going to have that same feeling. Like you're yeah. letting something down, like literally right. you know, right. in the situation, right. You're playing with your friends in a, you know, a match or whatever else has to be going on, you know, and that can't stop. You just can't save it and walk away. You know, it's so that match is going to last 20 minutes, half hour, whatever it may be. And if you just sort of like turn off your machine and walk off, it's, it's like incredibly rude actually to the other people who are playing. So mm -hmm. in that sense, that, that seems to help a lot is if you can, you know, with your kids, if they're playing, you know, again, these more episodic games, um, like Fortnite's a good example mm -hmm. uh, that you can just say, you know, we, we got to leave in 15 minutes. You know, if whenever you finish your current game, if you can stop, say goodbye to your friends and we got to go. Uh, if they then continue it, then it's on now. Right. You know, but if you just yeah. sort of walk in and say, shut off the machine, you're kind of being a dick, you know. Yeah. Um, so your, your kid being angry at you is an appropriate response, actually. Yeah. That's, um, <laughs> that's, that's good to call it, call it out straight. Yeah, like they are behaving in a normal human way to yeah. your dick. <laughs> totally. Um, so yeah. stop, you know. Um, no, it's just better planning. I mean, it, it, obviously, it's a misunderstanding. The parents don't mean to be, you know, dicks. But I, I, um, I mean, I, I admit I've been a dick before and I, I <laughs> reflect on it and realize it and. <laughs> it's, this, it's this feeling, of course, I, I feel like for parents, there comes a moment when we kind of, when our switch gets really flipped, when we feel like we're being disrespected. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't think that we always are when we feel like we are. I don't think yeah. our kids are always intending to disrespect us when, when we get that feeling. But I know that yeah. for myself, you know, just being transparent here in, in front of <laughs> everyone who's listening, um, that's the thing that is hardest for me as a parent is when... I feel disrespected and that's when I, let's say, need to work the hardest on emotional regulation and expressing myself, you know, the right way. So, yeah. and it, it happens sometimes with gaming. If I, if I just say to my son, okay, it's time to stop. And I, and he's just continuing to push it, push it, push it. I start to feel disrespected, but it's helpful to remember just, you know, give him plenty of warning. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I do sometimes when I'm, when I'm doing well, I let him, I let him, you know, explain to me exactly what he's trying to accomplish in the game. And I can see how sometimes, all right, yeah, that, that makes sense that it would suck to have to stop right now. So yeah, those are my yeah. reflections here. Yeah. And I'm in the same, like I said, I, I'm a parent of a teenager, so I feel your pain. Um, but I, I think it sometimes helps to remember too, that, you know, disrespect of parents is actually kind of developmentally normal for teenagers, mm. in particular, a moderate level. I mean, obviously yeah. if it's like, assault or something of that sort or like screaming whatever there you know it doesn't mean you should necessarily always tolerate it but you know, don't take it super personally it's kind mm. of um you know what i mean it's part of the separation process you know it should mm. be handled by both parties in a in a positive way uh, yeah. as much as possible and with when with boundaries and all that stuff but it is not like i think a lot of parents think like they're everybody else's kid is a sweet little angel and somehow they ended up with the little devil child and the, <laughs> the reality is this, this is actually fairly normal you know, process that teenagers have to go through. Mm. Uh, I think as the joke is, it's like, you know, when I was a teenager, I really, I realized how like stupid my parents were. And by the time I ended up in my mid twenties, I was surprised by how much they'd learned and you know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, you know, so it's kind of normal for teenagers to kind of think that their parents are, you know, so try, I, I, I've been there myself. I mean, I don't like being disrespected either, but you know, so we just have to kind of like keep a sense of humor and mm. keep it into perspective. You know, if they're not, you know, committing crimes or <laughs> on drugs or anything like that, you're actually doing pretty good. Yes. Uh, and just yes. set the boundaries, you know, for where some of this, so it's not getting too out of hand. Uh, you know, if they yell, then they need to apologize afterwards. Mm -hmm. about that. You know, that's mm -hmm. all fine. Give, give them a the time to walk off and, you know, and, and blow off a little steam, but then, you know, they should respond appropriately with an apology mm -hmm. if it's warranted. Uh, so, but um, now, now I'm getting off of video games into parenting advice, but. Uh, I mean, you're a clinical <laughs> psychologist. So this is valuable. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, with, you know, yeah, so with these other games, I think what, what tends to help is to set a schedule in advance with some of these things and and also kind of be realistic about what else is going on in the kid's life in the sense of like, like during the pandemic, it was really hard, I think, you know, for everybody. And, and it was particularly hard for kids because they weren't able to socialize. 
And so if you were a parent and you decided you're going to limit your kids to one hour of video games a day, what the hell else were they going to do? They, nothing. They weren't going to school. They weren't fanning out with their friends. They couldn't see grandma. They couldn't really, I mean, maybe they go outside in the yard or whatever, but if you live in Florida in the summer, that's only fun for so long, you know, or anywhere else in the winter, <laughs> it's only fun for so long, mm-hmm. you know? So what else are they supposed to do? You know, are they going to read? No, they're not going to read. You know, <laughs> I, no, nobody's ever read. Uh, I actually, I actually love reading, but, but most people don't, um, you know, so it's some, some, sometimes I think it's, you'd have to like, you know, if the activity isn't interfering with anything else, who cares? You know, it, you know, because I get a lot of these parents again, like my kids should be outside looking at trees. When did you do that when you were a teenager? You know, I didn't. Uh, you know, I don't know of anybody who did. Um, this is a thing 50 year olds do. Uh, it's not a thing 15 year olds do, you know. So I think sometimes people have to be a little bit, you know, the, it's not a problem because you don't like it. You know what I mean? It's a problem if the person's activity starts to interfere with their school, with their sleep. You know, they're not getting at least some 30 to 60 minutes of exercise a day. Um, they're not socializing with their friends. They're on, they express being unhappy. Mm-hmm. You know, they say like, you know, I wish I could play less and it's making me miserable. Then, yeah, that's, that's, that's not a good sign. You know, right. you're not having fun, you know, with the activity. Um, so those are the kind of things you want to look for. If that's, mm-hmm. if that's, if that's not coming up, then there's no magic number. You know, if a kid spends six hours a day playing video games, but they get their grades, you know, on track and, they get, you know, at least eight hours of sleep a night and they're otherwise happy. And they, and they, they you know, my son likes to walk. So he, he, we, have a, we have a small pool outside and he likes to walk around the pool. Yeah. Uh, and he'll do that for hours a day. So he gets plenty of exercise. So, yeah, um, yeah that's, whatever. that's, that's <laughs> guidance. Am I going to tell them to like take up calligraphy or something like that because it makes me feel good or whatever? I don't know. It's not, that's, you know. that's the best thing that you said that's ringing in my mind is like, it's just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. And yeah. that's a tough one to swallow, I think, for parents. But it's it's yeah. a good point. It's true. Like, and they're wasting their time. Mm-hmm. Who cares? You know, at the end of 80 some years, everybody gets the same six feet of dirt no matter what they did. So <laughs> if they're enjoying their time on Earth, is that so bad, you know, necessarily, you know, unless you're going to be Einstein, this is going to be a very nihilistic message, by the way, but unless you're like Einstein or Shakespeare or something like that in a hundred years, nobody will remember any of us. So the best we can do is to enjoy our time on the planet as much as we can. You know, that's the only other benefit other than fame uh, that, you know, we really realistically get out of it. So why make your kid take up the harpsichord, which they hate um, when they could be gaming with, which they love, as long as they're otherwise keeping their life together intact, why are you taking those hours away from your child? <laughs> they only get so many, you mm. know, um, to make you, you know, feel like you're an accomplished parent or something. I, I don't, I don't, I don't buy that necessarily. So, mm. so I'm sort of into this idea of like, you know, it's a very, it, what would be a, a hedonic message, I guess that, you know, you should try to encourage people to enjoy their time in life as much as possible and not mm-hmm. waste the time with things like work. Um, you know, <laughs> any, any more than they must, right. you know, we all must do some things, you know, support ourselves, you know, but, um, but anyway, yeah. So, um, my, son, course, my, okay, son, so, my son's going to love your answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, some people do overdo things. I mean, you know, so, so I don't want to say it's like, you know, obviously some people overdo gaming, either they're not happy that it is interfering with their schoolwork or, or work work or whatever else, you know, and of course that's true for lots of activities, you know, so right. this important thing to point out is that, you know, gaming is by far not the only activity that people overdo, you, get, you know, right. you're shopping addicts, you're exercise addicts, you know, you're uh, uh, work addicts. I don't right. understand that one. Addicts, work no, addicts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you get people with cats. I sometimes read this thing with cats, like Google cat lady, you know, or cat addict, you know, you'll see that people overdo cats. Uh, and stuff to the point that they're getting arrested for having oh. like 70 cats in their house and stuff, you know, wow. yeah, it's just okay. like animal abuse and stuff, you know, or, or neglect mm. or whatever, mm. um, you know, so to Google it, I don't, don't take my word for it. You want to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so these are, you know, so people do overdo a wide variety of things. So it is important to point out that, you know, we don't want to necessarily highlight one activity for shame when mm. it probably is more a problem with the individual, you know, they have a, some sort of whether it's a personality or impulse control or mental health disorder that's sort of leading them to overindulge in certain activities that are non-productive at the expense of more productive activities. But right. um, and the reason why it's probably very easy. You know, if you're suffering from depression, video games are fun. You know, um, and going to school where you're 
not getting good grades anyway or being bullied or something isn't fun. So, you know, yeah, you put more effort into the fun thing than the non-fun thing, you know, and that needs to be something that's dealt with. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but I'd say the comment I get from parents is like, why can't I get my kid to pay so much attention to their homework as they do to video games? It's like, do you remember being a kid? I mean, you, you, you didn't like hatch when you were 40, did you? I mean, you know, so, um, nobody, I mean, again, there's like that's like 5% of like kids yeah. who like ask the teacher for homework and stuff, but mm -hmm. everybody else like, you know, hated those kids. You know, most of us didn't like doing homework. I, I like stopped when I was in high school for the most part, um, and somehow managed to still graduate. But, um, <laughs> you know, so I think, I think sometimes, I don't know, a lot of people as they become parents, they become older, I think, you know, you know they start to forget what it's like to be a kid. And, and, and start to pathologize sort of like normal teen in particular behavior. Um, and I don't know why we do that. I don't know why it's so easy to forget the experience mm -hmm. of being an adolescent uh, and then to judge it when our adolescents do the same thing we did mm -hmm. um, at that age. But, um, but yeah, you know, so I mean, look, so again, for parents, just make sure, you know, make sure that the gaming isn't interfering with school and sleep and exercise and socialization other than that, as long as the kid's happy and everything else is going fine, then the problem's mostly with you, um, not with the kid uh, in that situation. But, you know, in terms of like, you know, if it is becoming like the kid's staying up and not sleeping, you know, you just want to set a, a clear schedule and then maybe have like a like a, an alarm essentially go off to give them that again, like a half hour reminder, 15 minute reminder and then zero, you know, so mm -hmm. that if they're in that situation where they're playing whether it's Minecraft or civilization that they start to get these warnings that their timer's running out and they yeah. need to prepare for that. Um, you know, and then, you know, you can have consequences, you know, so if, if they still keep playing and you catch them, you know, and have some sort of a, appropriate response, you know, mm -hmm. to don't overdo it. Don't mm -hmm. smash the Xbox in half. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> don't mm -hmm. shoot it. I've, there was a case mm -hmm. back about 10 years ago of a parent who shot a child's laptop. Oh uh, no. And posted it to YouTube. I would not do that. No. Um, but, uh, you know, an appropriate <laughs> behavior response um, that is key to the activity, uh, you know, see so removal of privileges and then an opportunity to restore the privileges when they get back on behavior, you know, so it's mm. kind of a typical thing. So mm. most cases that'll fix it. And of course the problems persist and you can look towards a, you know, child or adolescent psychologist who might be able mm. to help with it as well. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. I feel like you, you're actually able to blend personal experience with professional expertise there in your answer very nicely. And I appreciate that. Well, this has been really, really interesting to me. Like I said, it's like, I, I have my own perspective of my own video game experience. I'm a parent of a kid who loves video games. I'm in a society. I actually teach at a school, which was called Cogswell College for a long time on, in the Bay Area of California. And they recently changed their name to the University of Silicon Valley. And nice. it, draws, it draws a very, yeah, that's, that was a good call. I think that was a much more appealing name, but the, it draws a video, it, it draws a gaming crowd because they offer programs of video game development, mm, um, nice. animation programs. And, and it's a, I think, you know, I'm definitely going to share this conversation with them, my students in, in that school, because they, they are good examples of, people who absolutely love gaming and find so much joy in it and want to be creating them themselves. And it's, so it's meaningful. Um, and you know, they're, they're functional college students who are working really hard mm -hmm. toward an admirable goal. And I, and I think it's true that sometimes it does end up compromising physical health. I think sometimes that, you know, that that's probably common, but if you keep that in check and you're very mindful of that, but, but it's also hard to, again, like your whole point about these, sometimes it doesn't even correlate, but even if it does correlate, there's so many other factors in these people's lives that it's hard to really pick on the video games. So, yeah. but anyway, I don't want to go too far down that <laughs> rabbit hole just to say that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of surrounded by people for a couple of classes that I teach who have really dedicated their life to yeah. video games in terms of entertainment as well as educationally and professionally and uh and they turn out to be very very they have incredible imaginations incredible mm -hmm. imagination like the all the assignments that i've ever done with these particular students that involve creative thinking and imaginative thinking theirs are 
colorful, vivid, super original. So yeah, that's that's an observation I have. I don't know Very if it's cool. that that leads people to, to video games or video games fosters that or probably a little bit of both. Yeah. But yeah. And you you strike me as one of these people too, you know, that you, you seem to, I, I, we didn't get into your imagination, but my sense is that you have a very healthy imagination. Would you say that's true? Well, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the compliment, you know, don't want to like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you should even, I can't even start on all the ways I'm so imaginative. And brilliant. No, I, I do, I do like a lot of creative activities. That is true. I mean, I'm sure you can see the, uh, the guitars in the mm -hmm. background another one over there um so music and I, I write some fiction and stuff uh as well um so i, I still have it as it's, it's funny like I, i've mentioned it a couple of times i'm about to turn 50 so i'm at that kind of point of um you know it's a nice dividing line of like what have i accomplished and what mm -hmm. do i still want to accomplish you know in mm -hmm. terms of like what time i've got left and you know um and I'm, i think i'm fortunate enough to say that like i'm doing pretty good you know for 50 but you know on the other hand there still are a few things like I haven't gotten to become like a world favorite famous novelist yet, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's still a few of these like really pie in the sky aspirational goals. Mm -hmm. would be pretty, you know, pretty awesome. Or even just, uh, you know, play live more, you know, with the mm -hmm. guitar, even locally or something like that would be like, nice. I've abandoned the Pink Floyd, you know, uh, aspiration, but uh, you know, just to you know, do a little stuff that, you know, publicly would be kind of fun. That's awesome. That sounds like a really healthy place. Like being able to look back and, feel satisfied and and yet unsatisfied at the same time that's that's healthy it's the right yeah tension. yeah so well that's that's where i'm at you know so yeah creativity is always a good thing yes well that's a, that's a perfect note to end on <laughs> creativity is always <laughs> a good thing um and so thank you so much for you know hours of conversation and you know like i said in the beginning of the conversation you just you have a variety of expertise and I appreciate your the way your mind works, the way you think about things, the way you articulate things, your your observations, your honest attempt to get to the bottom of what data indicate. So I appreciate all the all the scholarship that you do, and and uh, good luck in attaining your future goals. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. I've really uh, really enjoyed chatting with you about all the stuff, and I appreciate you thinking of me to to have me on the podcast. My pleasure. All right. Well, let, let's stay connected. All right. Sounds good. All right. Have take a wonderful care. day. Bye-bye. You too. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.